So during this uh, time of quarantine, I, I think we've been in quarantine a little bit more than 60 days now. Um, my wife and I, she's not here, she's with our son, but we decided to, to try to stay f- somewhat physically in shape. Um, and it was actually her idea for us to start doing this program called Insanity Max 30. And I don't know if you've heard of it before. If you haven't heard of it before, I do not recommend it. It is the absolute worst thing that a person can do. Um, but I love my wife, and I, you know, I was like, I want to be supportive, and I was like, I probably need to work out, so let me, let me get in here and do this thing. But basically what it is, it's a DVD workout, and so you pop it into your DVD player, if people still have those anymore, um, or your PlayStation or whatever, and you just work out with Sean T, that's the guy's name on the TV. And I've come to realize, I, I can't say hate because I'm a Christian, but I strongly dislike <laughs> Sean T. Um, because the whole time you're doing this workout, he's just like yelling at you. And he's like, come on, you can do it. Just keep pushing. And I'm like, you're not even here right now. You don't even know what's going on. And, you know, it's like when you're working out, I, I don't know, for some reason, I just, when I'm, when I'm struggling in a workout, I just get frustrated. And so he's like yelling. I'm like, dude, shut up. Like, let me, let me focus and just get it together. But, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that I noticed is that during those workouts, you know, they have a, a modifier person who's kind of doing the workout, but a little bit easier, and then everyone else is doing it normally. And so I, I would notice that when I was going hard and, you know, doing my best, I was, I was sticking with Shanti, right? He's just crazy, jacked, ripped, just doing the workouts, pumping them out like it's nothing. But when I would get tired, I would slow down and either take a break or do the, the modified version of the workout. And I, I knew at the end of the workout that I'd gave my best if I was sore, you know, if I, if I felt it the next day or if I was hurting in some kind of way, right? Like whatever muscle group was targeted, which with insanity, it's every muscle group. So, you know, it, I, I, knew I, would, I knew I'd given my best if I was hurting the next day. I was like, okay, man, I, I pushed myself, right? I worked hard because I'm sore, right? Obviously, my body is responding to the hard work. But I knew that I didn't give my best if I wasn't sore. And also, I knew that I didn't give my best if I was doing the modified version for the majority of the workout, which if you go hard, it can still be a little bit challenging, but typically it's, it's, it's kind of easy. And so I was like, well, let me just stick to the modified version, right? It's a lot of jumping. And so instead of jumping, I'm just like, all right, I'm just modifying, right? You're like, oh, yeah, I'm working out. But I wouldn't feel it. Right? I, I wouldn't feel the hurt or the pain or, you know, whatever came with that. And so by the grace of God, we finished the program. Uh, it's a 60-day program. I think I missed maybe like four or five days. Lydia only missed like three or four. But we got through it, and it, it feels like, you know, kind of a victory. I'm like, all right, man, it's sanity. Like, yeah, all right, we did it. And as I look back on it, I wonder, I was like, man, I wonder if I could have given more. Like, I wonder if I actually did the very best that I could. And, you know, I think what comes with that, right, obviously there's, there's indicators, things that we know um, indicate that, okay, you gave your best, right? You did your absolute best. And the first character that we look at here in Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 4, is Abel. And we're going to talk about what Abel did that got him into the hall of faith. And so we're, we're just going to look at verse 4. I'll read Genesis 4, 1 through 5 for context after I read this verse. But we're going we're gonna to kind of dive into what made Abel so faithful. And so let's look at this passage here, or verse rather, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. It says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. And we'll just stop right there. Pause right there. And let's flip back over to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, so we can see what this offering was, what made it so much better than Cain's. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to two sons, uh, gave birth to Cain, and she said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked, worked the soil, 
In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his faith, face was downcast. And so as I read that story, right, the, the situation is going on, they're, they're giving an offering unto God. The Bible doesn't really specify what kind of offering it is. They're just offering something to God. And Cain comes and he offers the, the fat portions from the firstborn of the flock. Or sorry, Abel offers that. And Cain offers some fruits of the land. And as I was reading through Hebrews 11 and looking at this passage, right, I was like, what, what, what does this mean? Right? Why, why did God look upon Abel's offering with favor and not Cain's? What made Abel faithful? and what he offered. And I think the first thing that we can take away from this is that Abel gave God his best. He offered the best that he had to God. Now, I don't know if God didn't like Cain's offering. It, the Bible doesn't say that he, you know, well, Cain's offering is repulsive, get it away from me. It just says that he favored Abel's offering over Cain's. And I think it's because Abel offered the best that he had to give. What made his offering better than Cain's? Well, for one, it was meat. You know, I don't know. It's just like, I, I prefer meat over vegetables. You know, if you put two plates in front of me and it's like, here's, here's some beets and Brussels sprouts and here's steak, right? I'm going to go with the steak. I'm going to be like, I favor the steak. If there's vegetarians out there, amen, you know, you do you, but... The, the, I, I think most people will probably favor the meat. But, you know, obviously it's deeper than that. I, I think Abel had a lot more that he put forward. Not only did he give the fat portions, right, which is probably the better parts of the meat, of the cuts, right? It's the, it's the flavorful parts is where, you know, the part is like it's bursting with flavor. You look forward to that part of the meat. Um, but he also offered fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. And in this culture, the, the firstborn was typically looked at in a little bit higher regard. They were held in a little bit higher esteem. When it, when it came to people, if you were the firstborn, you had, you know, more expectations placed on you. You also received more of an inheritance than your other siblings because you had the rights as the firstborn. And so the firstborn of the flock, right, is pretty significant for, for able to give his firstborn, one of his firstborn lambs, and then on top of that to give the fat portions. I was like, man, this is as good as it gets. It doesn't get any better than this. And Cain just offered some fruits of the land, you know? And not, not that that's bad. I just don't think that it was his best. And I think because Abel gave his best, God favored his offering over Cain's. And I think the cool thing is that, you know, we don't really, like I said earlier, we don't know what kind of offering this was, if it was a sin offering or a guilt offering, an offering of praise or whatever. But I think Abel's heart was, it's an offering to God. It doesn't matter what the offering is for. It doesn't matter what the purpose is. It's, it's an offering to the God of the universe. So I'm going to give my best. I'm gonna, let me find the very best that I have to offer so I can give it to God. And I think about, okay, why, why was Abel considered faithful for this offering? Right, the, the author of Hebrews says that by faith, Abel brought a better offering than God. I think it's because it takes great faith to offer your best to God. I think about what Abel offered, right? Like what about what he gave made him faithful? I have to imagine that, I know it's probably not about money, That's, money has probably nothing to do with this, but if you think about it, it's like what Abel offered probably was worth a lot. You know, the, the, the firstborn of the flock, the fat portions, I mean, he probably could have got a lot of money for that. And typically the, you know, that, you, you don't sacrifice an animal or you don't slay an animal or eat it unless it's like a special occasion, right? It, it's something that is worth celebrating, is worth, man, go sacrifice the fattened calf, right? Serve the fat port. Like, this is a monumentous occasion. And so Abel gave up a lot by offering this to God. And I think because of that, 
he was considered faithful. And so, I, you know, obviously I feel like Abel sets an example for us to follow and, and what it looks like to give our best. And I think about, okay, what does it mean for us to give our best? We know that in order to give our best, we have to be faithful, right? Abel was faithful. He was, he was lifted up for being faithful because he gave his best. What does that look like? What does it mean to give God our best? I think it means we give in such a way that is sacrificial. It means that when we offer something to God, or if we're doing something for God, we're going to go above and beyond to make sure that it's our best. And I think we know that it's our best when it hurts a little bit. When we feel a little bit inconvenienced, or we feel like, ah, man, I, you know, I could not give this and stay comfortable, but, you know, here's, here's the best that I have to offer. And it, it's going to hurt me a little bit, but it's God. So I'm going to give him my best. I, I think that's what it looks like. It, it comes at a cost to us. It causes us pain in some kind of way. It causes us inconvenience in some kind of way. And I think in order to give this way, right, we, we first have to be willing to trust that God's going to take care of us, that God's going to provide. Man, if, if, we don't, if we're not faithful, right, if we don't feel like, man, I don't, I don't believe that God's going to provide for me, then we're not going to give our best. We're not going to sacrifice the best that we have to offer. We're going to give in such a way that says, you know what, here's what I have. Here's what I can give and still feel comfortable. Here's what I can give and still feel like, okay, my hope and my trust is in what I have and what I can do, as opposed to, you know what, let me just give in such a way that says, God, you're in control and I trust you and I have faith in you. And doesn't God deserve the best that we have to offer? I mean, it's the God of the, he gave us life, created us, created this world that we live in, wants to have a relationship with us, gave us his best that he has to offer. So shouldn't we want to give God our best? I, I have to think that that was Abel's mentality. Man, God is so good. I'm so undeserving. God gave me his best. So, you know, I, I hear some fat portions. Here's a lamb. You know, what is this to God, really? At the end of the day, fruits, meat, is it really anything to God? No, but I think the heart behind it, the heart that says, I want to be inconvenienced so that I can offer my best to God, I think God takes pleasure in that. You know, some, some reasons why it might be challenging for us to offer our best to God, I, I think of comfort. I think we can be complacent lazy, selfish, that's a big one for me, is selfishness, pride, I think fear, right? Like, man, what's going to happen if I do this? What's going to happen if I give in such a way that leaves me inconvenienced? I think even during this time, right, with this pandemic going on, there's a lot of ways where we can kind of pull back because of fear. Man, I don't know if I can keep giving in the same way that I was used to when things were normal. I think that's where God wants us. And I, I think when we give our best in that way, it communicates how much faith we have in God. But when we're in those places and we, and we allow those mentalities to, to take root in our mind and in our hearts, we start to give just a little bit less than our best. You know, when I was working out and I was getting tired, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit less effort, right? So let me just modify for like a minute. Okay, let me modify for like five minutes. Okay, I'm going to modify for like 15 minutes. And then I was like, okay, I'm not working out today, right? That's what happened on those days where I didn't work out. I was like, ah, I just, I don't want to do it. But I think that's how it's, it's like this gradual decline, right? We let all these things kind of creep in, the comfort, the laziness, the selfishness. And then we start to love just a little bit less. We start to give a little bit less of our time to people. We start to tithe just a little bit less, right? Let me, let me pull back just a little bit. And then sometimes we can stop doing these things altogether because we've allowed these mentalities to creep in and cause us to, miss, to, to lose sight of what's most important. You know, I, I think of, of people in the scriptures who have offered their best to God, and I, I can't help but think of David, guy after God's own heart, 2 Samuel chapter 24, right, you know, David is, uh, you know, negotiating with this guy. He's, this dude's trying to give David all this stuff to sacrifice to God. And he's like, here, just take it. 
take all this stuff, offer it as an offering to God, and don't, don't give me any money. You can just have it for free. And what's David's response? It's like, no. Are you out of your mind? That, I'm not going to do that. It's like, I'll take your stuff, but you're going to take my money for it. And he says, I won't offer sacrifices to God if it costs me nothing. Talk about faith. Talk about a confidence in God's ability to provide. I, I think David understood what it was like to give his best. He's like, no, if, if it doesn't cost me anything, then I'm not doing the best that I can. I'm not giving the best that I have to offer. I think about the, the poor widow in Luke 21, right? Jesus sees her offering her gift in the, uh, in the temple and she puts in her two copper coins and everybody else is just kind of given out of their abundance. And he's like, she put in more than everybody else did because she gave all that she had to live on. And widows were already poor, right? They didn't have anyone to provide for them or meet their needs. They were kind of just left to fend for themselves. And so for her to give her money, her two copper coins, she, she was giving at a cost to herself. She's like, man, I don't know. You know, this is, this is all I have to live on. But you know what? It's better in God's hands than it is in mine, so I'm going to offer it. And Jesus says that that's her best. And she gets lifted up as a woman of faith in the Bible. But I think in order for us to give in such a way that is best, one, we have to have faith, right? I think that's what Abel had. He had faith. He trusted God. And then two, we have to give in such a way that's going to cost us something. It's going to hurt us a little bit. And then if we keep reading here, we can see the result. So let's look here in Hebrews 11, chapter 4. We'll read the rest of this verse. It says, By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. And the second thing we can learn from Abel and his example is that God loves to bless our best. Abel gives his best, right? He offers his sacrifice to God, and then he gets commended by God as righteous. Right? The, obviously, the, the story doesn't have, an happy, have a happy ending for Abel because he's murdered by his brother Cain. But God remembers him. And I think that's how God blesses him. God cements him in history and uses him as an example for generations and generations to come. And he gets to be commended by the God of the universe. I think that's more of a blessing than any physical or monetary thing, than any relationship. To have God remember you in such a way is the greatest blessing that any of us could ever hope to have to be commended by God as righteous, to be an example. God's like, look, look at what Abel did. Do, do what he did. Give in the way that he gave. Sacrifice in the way that he sacrificed because he gave his best. To be in that place in God's mind is a huge blessing, right? And obviously what Abel did went down in history and, and the generations after him knew of his sacrifice, right? The the, the scriptures here were written to, you know, the Israelite people. Um, but I, I can't help it. It was cool. I was thinking about uh, or looking at this commentary uh, on Abel and on his sacrifice. And something that was cool that struck my attention is, you know, Abel offered a lamb to God. And then several centuries later, when the Hebrews are enslaved in Egypt and, you know, God sends the, the angel of death to come and slay the firstborn of the whole land, Right? He's like, hey, sacrifice a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and the angel will pass over you. Right? And that's, that became kind of the staple of Passover, is the blood of the lamb, right? And then going further, once they get out of Egypt, what's sacrificed on the Day of Atonement for the sins of all the people is a lamb. And then you go even further, and who gets sent into the world? Jesus, who's referred to as the Lamb of God. And in one sense... God's firstborn, right? God's only son. And so I, I, I can't help but think that, man, God had, he, he had to have Abel in mind during all of that. I, I think Abel left an impression on God. I think he, he had, I think he moved God's heart in some kind of way. I don't think all of these things are coincidence. I don't think that the lamb plays 
such an integral part of Scripture, right? The idea of a lamb, of a spotless lamb. Abel, Abel offered his best. You didn't dare offer a blemished lamb to God on the Day of Atonement. That was bad. That was a no-no. And there were consequences for that, for offering a defective and a blemished lamb. He's like, no, it has to be spotless. It has to be the best among the flock. I think God had Abel in mind. And I think God wants to keep us in mind in that way. I think God wants to remember us. God wants to lift us up. I think God loves to reward our faith. Hebrews 10.38 says that God delights in those who are faithful, but he takes no pleasure in those who shrink back. God loves to lift up examples of faith. He, think about that, right? To be remembered by God. For God to be like, man, Derek Sneller. Man, that guy, he is faithful. That guy always gives me his best, no matter what. Hazel Hawkins, man, she is a woman of faith. I know that she's given me her best. I remember her example. People should follow her example, right? Nate Schrader, man, that guy is a man of faith, a man of conviction. He offers me his best. That's my guy. I love it. It's awesome. Isn't that a blessing? But I think when we don't give our best, when we're not faithful, not that God just completely forgets about us, man, I think we just miss out on what God wants to do. We miss out on an opportunity to be an example for other people. We miss out on opportunities to be used by God when we're not faithful. And to be used by God, to be remembered by God, to be commended by God is a blessing. You know, when I moved here for the first time to, to leave campus ministry, um, you know, Vince was, was still leading the church here, and he would always tell me stories about Janice, and he would always tell me stories about Lawrence. Neither of those guys were here at the time, but I feel like those guys left an impression on the church with their faith. You know, I specifically think about Lawrence, and I probably had maybe three conversations with Lawrence Willis. Um, one of those times he was here for the anniversary service in, back in 2017, and I called him on the phone because a brother was being prideful and I was getting some input. Um, but, you know, I, I, I had a few conversations with Lawrence, and I feel like even though I've only interacted with him just a few times, I felt like I knew him. From the way that Janice talked about him and all the examples and, and all the stories that I've heard, I was like, man, I feel like I know this guy. And honestly, I felt like, man, I gotta be like this guy. This guy set an example. I was like, I don't even know him. I've never seen him do ministry. You know, I've never met him personally at that time, but I was like, this dude set an example that I need to follow. And I knew, that it was, I knew that it was an example I should follow because of the way people talked about him. It's like, this guy did something great here in Columbia. Vince would tell me stories about, he's like, man, dude, Lawrence this, Lawrence did that, and like, you know, such an awesome guy. I was like, man, that's awesome. You know, I think about Vince himself, obviously he's in St. Louis now, but the mark that he left on this church, the faith of that man, I tell you, was something like nothing else that I've seen. And I feel like it left a huge, huge impact on this church. I think about someone who's no longer with us today. I think about Miss Martha and the woman of faith that she is. I, I only, you know, I only got the privilege of having a few conversations with her, you know, because she passed not too long after I moved here. But I just remember hearing her story, you know, and, and how she became a disciple and I remember having those conversations with her and how uplifting and how encouraging she was. And I can just tell this woman loves God. There's no doubt about it. And I, when I was talking to Miss Martha, I felt like I was I don't know, on a mountaintop. She was just building me up, encouraging me and all these different things. And I was like, you don't even know me that well. <laughs> but but she, she was just lifting me up. She's like, bro, I love it when you leave songs and like all these different things. And I, I think that was a woman of faith. Right, I remember at our Christmas banquet, we had the, the, the you know, family group videos that we did, seeing Miss Martha with the hat on and rapping and, and dabbing in the video. And I was like, man, she's invested. 
she's faithful. She cares, right? She, she's invested in the church. But I think about all these examples. I think, about, I think about how much we remember these guys, how much we remember these men and women because of their faith, because of the example that they set. How much more does God remember? I, I think God remembers them as well. You know, Lawrence and, and Vince are still here. He still remembers their example. He remembers Miss Martha's example. But they left a mark because of their faith, and I believe God's proud of them. And I believe God has blessed them and will bless them. And I think it can be the same for us, right? God wants to bless us when we give our best. But we have to put ourselves in a position that says, you know what, I'm going to trust you, God. Even though I feel all these things, even though, you know, all the world is experiencing all the craziness that it is right now, I'm still going to offer you my best. I'm still going to love people the best that I can. I'm still going to give my time to people the best that I can. God, I'm going to give my best to you. Whatever it takes, I want to give you my best. And that was Abel's example. Doesn't, the Bible doesn't really mention Abel other than here and, and in Genesis, but man, the mark that he left in Scripture and for us today was monumental because that's what it means to give our best. We give in a way that's sacrificial. We give at a cost to us. And then we can sit back and watch God do his thing. And we can take pleasure in the fact that God takes pleasure in us when we're faithful, when we give our best. And so I want to leave you guys with a challenge this morning. I thought it would be good for us to, to take a, a really good look at our lives and examine, hey, where, where am I really not, where, where am I not giving my best? Is there an area in my life, an area in my discipleship, in my spirituality, in my walk with God, where I'm not really giving my best? I would encourage us to come up with a good old-fashioned repentance plan. Identify one area in your walk with God where you're currently not giving him your best. And then ask yourself why. What, what is it? Why am I not giving my best? Is it fear? Is it laziness? Is it selfishness? Is it anger? Is it hurt? Whatever. Is, what's the reason? What's the motivation? And take that to God in prayer. The third thing is, is find a passage that addresses that particular area. Find God's heart on the matter. Why is it important that we give our best in whatever area it is? And how does God feel about it? And then lastly, come up with a plan of action to implement so that we can start giving God our best. What does it look like for you to give God your best in that area? And what can you do to start moving towards that? So, you know, just simple repentance plan here, but I, I think it's, it's pivotal. I, I think if we're going to be lights in this broken world, if we're going to if we're going to change the world, if we're going to have an impact in this world, man, we got to be willing to do the very best that we can for God. We're not going to be lights in the darkness where we're not going to have any kind of impact for God if we're faithless and if we're not giving our best. And the two go hand in hand. You can't give your best if you're not first faithful. If you don't trust God, if you don't believe that God's going to come through, then why would you give your best? So I think if it's an issue of faith, hey, let's build our faith. Read some scripture, get open, pray, whatever you got to do, build your faith. But we got to give our best. And then God will take that and use it to do incredible things. And then hopefully, you know, we'll get to be in our own hall of faith like Abel was. Thank you guys for letting me speak.